Hello, hello, good evening. Amigos, amigas. Welcome to Lima. Welcome to Peru, to my home. Tonight, we are going to continue with my series about the great mysteries of Peru. In this space, we talk about unsolved cases, mysterious cases of the archaeology history of Peru. I hope you enjoyed tonight's event. And by the way, one of the reasons why I decided to create this series is because of me being a big fan of the X-Files. That's why <laughs> you have like as a background song, the song of the X-Files. One of the hits, right? I think it was the, the 90s, right? <laughs> Hola, Adrian. Hello. Thanks for coming, my, my friend. Gracias, amigos. So tonight we are going to continue with a mystery and we are going to travel to a land that is a, a desert land in the south coast of Peru. We're going to Ica and we're going to talk about the mysterious engraved stones of Ica. We're going to try to solve also oh, this, this mystery. Uh, at least I will try to give you the tools to understand uh, the, the story behind uh, the engraved stones of Ica. So, well, I think we are ready to start. Thank you so much for visiting my home tonight in Lima, Peru. My name is Vanessa Vasquez. I am your Lima City tour guide. I do these, these tours uh, at least once a week, uh, tours about history, about archaeology, about culture. Sometimes I do cooking classes. Sometimes I also do street tours, which is my, my strength, right? As a tour guide, I've been doing these tours for several years, since the year 2015. Hola, Lou. Thanks for coming. <laughs> and, um, but also as a tour guide, I, I am a very curious person. I love history. And I know most people around the world don't know about Peru. Uh, basically, uh, Peru's uh, untold stories, right? Uh, the ones that are not really out there that you will not see easily uh, on a YouTube channel in English. Um, so the intention of these events that I'm doing is to uncover uh, mysteries of Peru. Uh, so in tonight's event, that is part of my series called The Great Mysteries of Peru, we're going to talk about uh, the mysterious message in the uh, engraved stones of Ica. So I think we are now ready. Thank you so much for your participation. And don't forget that you have the comment section for any questions, for anything you would like me to clarify. See? So let's start with this event. So tonight's mystery is about stones that suddenly appear in the 1960s in the south of Peru in the uh, zone called Ica. So we're going to board now this, this theme and I will explain all the story um, around these stones. Right? So the location where the stones appeared is the south coast of Peru, the department of Ica. Peru is divided in 24 departments. Lima, the city where I live, is located in the department of Lima. But immediately uh, below Lima, south Lima, we have another department that is called Ica. Um, so Ica itself is subdivided in provinces. Okay, so one of the provinces of Ica is the famous Nazca. Nazca is considered one of the most important touristic destinations in Peru. And the reason is also another mystery that I have already talked about in 
other events as done here, the Nazca lines. So the Nazca lines, these mysterious drawings that you just can see from, from the air, from planes, uh, is also one of the most interesting uh, destinations we have in Peru. So uh, just in general uh, words, let's say Ica is a site that is very rich in archaeology, in history. So uh, the whole country, to be very honest, Peru uh, is, is all covered with archaeological sites. So when tourists come to Peru and go to Ica, it's usually because they want to see archaeological sites, like for example the one of Nazca, or maybe they want to go to uh, spend some time doing some uh, extreme sports also. We have some really fun uh, activities to be done there. Uh, so. By the way, we have also many, many ancient societies here in, in Peru. But if we talk in particular about Ica, we have to talk about the Paraca Society and also the Nazca Society. By the way, my friends, <laughs> I will need to do a little, little quick interruption because someone is knocking my door. <laughs> so I think it's my girls. Please just give me a second. I'm so sorry for making you put on hold, but I am alone at home. <laughs> so I have to open the door. Just give me a second, please. I'm back. Hello, hello. <laughs> so, okay, it was my, my girls are coming back home. So, uh, I was mentioning that Peru is a land of many different cultures. So, um, most of the travelers that come to Peru know about the Incas, right? Uh, but we had also different societies uh, before the Incas that uh, appear in different parts of Peru that develop amazing societies in Peru and in the territory where we're going to be today, uh, Ica, we had two that are very important. We have one Paracas culture. Paracas culture emerged about 3,000 years ago. Some specialists believe that 1,000 years before Christ, this society started to create amazing uh, architecture uh, in the desert. And also one of the most important things about this culture is the fact that they were very advanced in terms of um, medical, uh, uh, let's say, um, in the medical field. Uh, why? Because these people were the first society of Peru that, uh, uh, let's say, uh, that were able to achieve, uh, for example, surgeries to the skull, to the brain, that were successful. How we know this? Uh, because they are in archaeological sites, remains of trepanations. This is how we call these uh, sophisticated surgeries. The trepanations were um, sort of like openings made on the skulls of the uh, people. We don't know exactly why. We think that Possibly, uh, of course, a, a more, uh, let's say, a, a, a practical answer would be uh, to save the life of someone that maybe received a, a accidental uh, hit in the, in the head or because of a combat, for example. Um, so there was co that caused some type of pressure, um, coagulation also in that section and the creation of a clot of blood. So in order to free to liberate the space uh, that, that that clot of blood was occupying, these people tried to use this, um, this system of trepanation to open space, uh, to open a portion, a section of the skull, and clean in that way the blood in the area. That's the most accepted, let's say, explanation about the trepanations. Other people, other archaeologists believe this was sort of like an initiation in the shamanic world, in the world of the, or in the, in the let's say, root of a priest of that time, right? So just to give you an idea about the Paracas, right? We're not talking today about the trepanations, maybe in another occasion I'm going to talk about this, but just to give you an idea how advanced the people of Ica used to be, and also how mysterious, right? Because the next society we are going to talk about, Nazca, the Nazca culture, that also uh, live in that territory of the country, also referred as the 
uh, sort of like a, 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 the more advanced development of the Paracas, so basically like the successors of the Paracas, the descendants of the Paracas, the Nazca people who emerged at the beginnings of the Christian era about 2,000 years ago, and that disappear around the year 800 of our era, were the ones who created the famous Nazca lines, my friends. Um, I have already explained in another event uh, the Nazca lines and how uh, they, they were made from the perspective of archaeologists and also from the perspective uh, of people who are not archaeologists that believe also more in the UFOs, um, let's say, um, explanations, um, that, um, let's say, uh, extraterrestrial explanations also. So uh, we have different positions. Uh, let me explain today the one that is more like the archaeological accepted explanation, which is very simple. Uh, in the desert of Nazca, in the territory where Ica is, uh, basically a big desert, that used to be millions of years ago covered with water. So it used to be below the ocean, uh, that section. Uh, and that we know because we still have fossils there of, of sea animals. That soil that nowadays is desert uh, because of the uh, contact with the sun, right, the radiation, the sun, uh, the soil in the upper part has oxide. Um, the elements there in that sediment that is sort of like gravel, right, it's not sand. The section in the upper part is like a gravel. Um, it turns red and red and red and red over the time. So more time passes, reddish it turns. So this section, uh, superficial, which is a reddish color, was removed easily by the Nazca people back in that time, you know, and when you remove that superficial layer, what you have below is white sand, is white sand. Uh, so the contrast of colors uh, that makes the reddish on top and that white below is what makes also easy from the air to see the drawings, the Nazca lines. So making them was not extremely complicated. What is uh, fascinating is why. There, when we talk about why, uh, there we, we of course, uh, sometimes have to reach out, you know, like interesting theories uh, that explain the what, what is the meaning in them. So um, now you know that Ica, in general, is a land of mysteries, is a land of archaeology. So we have to now jump in the time, uh, do a, a little jump in the history of Peru until the colonial period. So in the colonial period, we had several chronists, several um, cronistas is what, how we call them in Spanish. So the chroniclers, uh, which most of them were Spanish, uh, were priests usually, uh, were the ones who witness uh, the, the changes that happen in the early colonial periods, um, in the early colonial time, in the whole Hispanic America, in particular here in Peru, the falling of the Incas. They were able to meet people who lived during the Inca times before the Spaniards came. And also some of these chroniclers uh, were able to meet people who lived during the times of the Incas, but uh, way in the, uh, deep in the, in the colonial era. So uh, not all of them were in the moment of the conquest. But some of these chroniclers were indigenous. And we value the most, I think, uh, more the, the indigenous chroniclers, which were not so many, because of course they were not so many, and also because uh, they were indigenous and they're understood of the locals, the language of the indigenous. One of the cases is Juan de Santa Cruz Pachacuti. Uh, Juan de Santa Cruz Pachacuti um, created a document that is called Relación de Antigüedades de este Reino del Perú, Relation of Antiques. No, later on the name uh, Mutito Peru. Um, so this uh, this chronicler made by Juan de Santa Cruz mentioned 
many of this that he ate in the time of the Incas, the Incas of Peru, uh, the insects is called mancos. He referred to these stones as mancos. What is a manco? The explanation is that those were stones who were engraved that were of great value because in them was, was transmitted knowledge, information, information about the past. So uh, this is the first document in which we know of, of the existence of engraved stones which were of great value. Um, so now we're going to jump again in the history of Peru to the present time, in this case, to the 1960s. Um, in the 1960s, the coast of Peru, especially the Department of Ica, suffered a really, really bad uh, demographic, uh, sorry, um, climatic crisis. Um, the reason was caused by heavy rains that occurred in the Andes. Uh, in Peru, we have three regions. We can divide the country in three regions, coast, Andes, and the jungle. We are in the coast. Lima is in the coast and also Ica is in the coast. So the coast is desert, right? It is amazing because the ancient societies of the coast of Peru learn to live, to survive in the desert with no problems. They created great civilizations without the need of, you know, like constant rains or, or constant flow of water into the whole territories where they live. But they just learn how to use properly the water, to channel the water, and that's how they were able to survive. So uh, in the coast of Peru, we need the rain of the Andes, but not to happen, of course, in the coast. We need the rain to happen in the Andes. So in that way, the rivers will flow in this direction and will go in direction to the ocean. So we use the water from those rivers. But every once in a while, we have, uh, let's say, uh, disasters, right? We have uh, the overflows of, of rivers. Uh, we have too much rain uh, in, in the Andes. So sometimes that causes problems. So in the year 1960, uh, the Ica River, uh, the, one of the most important rivers of Ica, overflow, a uh, consequence of these heavy rains. And um, this also caused something uh, peculiar because um, the, the river uh, started to create arms, right? Uh, and these arms of the river penetrated in territories which were desert and also opened archaeological sites which were not really investigated yet uh, by by the specialists so um, in this case well nature uh, um, made its way uh, in direction to new archaeological findings um, so just to give you an idea about the Rica Ica river here we have the uh, river and uh, it passes through the district of Okukaje. Keep in mind also this district, this is a humble location in Ica, uh, where still we have lots of farmers in that section. It's a, it's a really poor location in, 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 the, uh, in the department of Ica. And uh, this is uh, the Rio Ica, by the way, which is, let's say, the river that um, initiated the whole story in a way, right? So with the arm of the river, Right. Also, uh, some sections which were also in the desert um, started, suddenly were open and even fossils were discovered also. So just to give you an idea again that that territory of Ica used to be millions of years ago below the ocean, also, which is fascinating. So going back to the stones, to the mancos, maybe you remember about the mancos, right? Um, so this, um, let's say, disaster, uh, in a way, also permitted, uh, let's say, archaeologists to reach out some archaeological sites which were um, covered by the sands of the desert. And in them also were discovered the first engraved stones, right? So uh, these stones, which were of different forms, different designs. Uh, some of them were like flowerly designs. Some of them were uh, fishes, were uh, animals, right? Were uh, simple um, uh, designs, um, which were also before that occasion not really seen in other archaeological sites. It's very unusual really for Peru um, to see, um, or, or, or let's say for the archaeology in Peru, uh, to see this type of work. Uh, because my 
Incan ancestors and pre-Inca ancestors use usually potteries to design, to, to um, let's say, um, to share information, to save information. It usually was potteries or fabrics. Mm -hmm. uh, and soon also I am preparing, I think it's going to be for ending next week, a lecture about the, um, the written system of the Incan times. So we're going to also discover together how used to be uh, this system, if we had any, uh, by the way. So I'm going to be talking about that next week. But basically, these designs in the stones were very simple, oh, of, of not really uh, great, uh, let's say, um, uh, not a really great uh, archaeological finding. So that's why archaeology is sort of like dismiss a little bit uh, these, uh, these elements. So now we're going to talk about another person, uh, a person that is, I think, the central character of our story. And um, the name of this person is Dr. Javier Cabrera Darquea. Lu, muchas gracias. Thank you so much for your support. Gracias, gracias. So Dr. Javier Cabrera Darquea, uh, he was not an archaeologist. No? He was an enthusiast of uh, the archaeology, the history, but he was a physician. He was a, a doctor, right? Um, so uh, this gentleman uh, ended up so, so fascinated about the stones that we're going to talk about in a moment that he created a huge collection of them, right? So um, Dr. Javier uh, Cabrera, uh, Dr. Cabrera, first uh, was uh, able to, to get in contact with the stones um, that later he uh, treasured and he even made a museum about in Ica in the year 1966. So the person who introduced him to these stones was a close friend, a childhood friend of his, uh, Felix Josa. And um, he, uh, Mr. Josa, gave to Dr. Cabrera uh, as, a, as a little souvenir, a little present, a uh, Pisa papel. What is a pisa papel? It's a paperweight, uh, just a simple, you know, stone engraved that, well, when, when Dr. Cabrera received, he, he felt a, a strange fascination for. So um, Mr. Josa uh, mentioned to his friend that he bought uh, that uh, souvenir, let's say, uh, to a looter. Right, so um, that it was uh, a archaeological piece, right? So, um, well, Dr. Cabrera uh, found it really strange. First of all, um, well, this the shape in it. This is the first stone, by the way, in the picture that he got from his friend. Uh, he saw there this the shape of a fish, which was um, like no fish uh, that you can find in the market nowadays. So it was a, a very strange fish. And also another thing is the weight of the stone. It was very, very heavy. In comparison to the volume of the stone, he found it an, an strangely heavy, right? So later, uh, over the years that the past, and, and he did his own research, and he uh, he left, but he put aside uh, his his profession as a doctor, embracing all uh, his interest in understanding the stones. Um, he did his own research, and he uh, realized later, after many years, that uh, the fish uh, was in fact a. Salacanto. The salacanto was a, is a fish that uh, was believed to be extinct. Actually, in the 1930s, uh, it was rediscovered, but it, it was believed to be extinct. And uh, here you have a fossil of salacanto, uh, and the salacantos existed uh, about 65 million years ago. So just to give you an idea how old this fish is. But um, in the year 1936, the Salacantos were again spotted, again seen uh, in South Africa, right? So very curious also uh, the story of this fish, right? Uh, lost and found again. So um, there's another character of our story that we're going now to talk about. The name of this person is Basilio Uchuya Mendoza. So Basilio Uchuya Mendoza, also syndicated as a, a looter uh, by the authorities of Peru, um, he was the person who provided the stones 
to Dr. Cabrera. Right. So remember that initially uh, this this uh, situation, you know, of, of Dr. Cabrera buying stones, buying pieces uh, to uh, Mr. Basilio Chuya was something like uh, under the under the table. And uh, well, people were not really talking like uh, out there about uh, something like this because this was looting. Although back in the 60s, there was not really big protection for our patrimony, to be very honest. The protection also started after the 70s very strong in the 90s with new laws. So back then it happened, but people really don't care much about that. So uh, Mr. Basilio ended up giving to Dr. Cabrera a big number of stones in several years of cooperation. Can we say that? <laughs> of, of, of work mutual cooperation. Um, in the case of Dr. Cabrera with money and also Basilio Chuya, you know, finding the pieces, the stones. So he gave over 15,000 stones to Dr. Cabrera. Um, I was able to um, also look for lots of YouTube videos, uh, looking for the information for creating this event for you all. Uh, of course, you can imagine that the information that is out there is 99% in Spanish. Um, so that's why I also felt it was interesting uh, to, to do this in English for you all. So in the only um, interview made to Dr. Cabrera, where you can see Dr. Cabrera talking and explaining the stones, he, um, he says really interesting things. Um, one of the things that trapped my attention the most was the way how he referred to the indigenous, to the farmers, uh, to the peasants that gave the stones to him. It is very curious. The reason is because um, he referred in the interview to them as humble ignorant farmers that's exactly the the way of uh, but translated it all from the spanish oh? uh, ignorantes y humildes granjeros that's what he says um so that's why i quote it exactly here so it's a really really harsh and impolite way to present the people who gave him uh, the stones but he says also in 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 favor of these indigenous that because they were ignorant and humble, they would not be capable or, of creating something like the stones he received, right? So he, what he was trying to say is that they had no capacity to create this, these elements decorating the stones, right? Um, also, he said that um, these, these uh, farmers from Okukaje um, were, uh, first, they tried to reach out archaeologists, but... Um, that the archaeologists dismiss the information, dismiss the stones they were given to them because, once again, they were humble and ignorant farmers. So that everybody was dismissing them because of their origin, humble origin. Um, so this is why, um, well, Mr. Mr. Uh, Dr. Cabrera, um, consider first that the origin of these stones is, is true. Uh, it was not fate. Also, another reason why he says it's impossible that these stones are a falsification is because to do a falsification of something, you need to have an original, uh, something like original that you are copying that has high demand. Like, for example, a Mona Lisa, right? If you have a Mona Lisa, you will try to do a copy of that because it has demand. In the case of the stones, he said that uh, there they cannot be a falsification of something that is unique, no? that just like appeared in, at that moment, and, and, and why will they be copying something with no uh, scientific value, right? So that was his, in his defense, that was uh, his opinion, right? Um, oh, uh, thank you, Berhan. Thanks for coming, my friend. So, but Basilio made nice money on those stones. Oh, yes, uh, of course. We cannot deny that, my friend. Remember, 15,000 stones were given uh, to Dr. Cabrera, right? So we don't know. Of course, it's kept on reserve how much Dr. Cabrera paid for the stones. You know? Either like true or false, you know, like a real falsification. Uh, uh, Mr. Basilio and his, uh, let's say, collaborators made a good deal of money indeed, of course. And later we're going to go back to that theme too, my friend. So, um, well, it's, it's really interesting also to see that um, Dr. Cabrera uh, considered this 
stones that you're about to see, my friends, because you haven't seen any yet, right? A stone book, a book from the past, from a past civilization uh, that existed in planet Earth 16 million years ago in an era where dinosaurs existed and that they tried to transmit information to the future civilizations that will come through these stones. So this is just a picture of how the collection, just a little portion of the collection, looks like in the museum of Dr. Cabrera. Adrian, muchas gracias. Thank you. Thanks for your support. So uh, first of all, uh, I would like, before we go to describe some of the stones, I would like to give you some characteristics, like give you an idea of the characteristics of the stones. So um, in most of the cases, the stones are significantly uh, more heavier than the volume uh, of the stone. No? So it's also a, a peculiar detail. Um, so the stones, which are pebble stones, right? Um, they seem to, to be inside in the core, in the center of the stone, harder than in the external section. The external section looks um, sort of like a, a softer, feels softer than the core. Uh, I will show you also in a moment a picture about that. And that external section was the one carved, of course. Uh, there is even a classification uh, on the stones. This is, by the way, my classification because officially I was not able to find any classification from the museum. Um, but um, because there are many different elements all mixed. But I've done one classification uh, that will, will give you an idea of what kind of elements, what kind of information you can find in the stones. So first of all, we have stones that uh, refer to the cosmos, uh, to uh, to constellations, to the stars, right? Um, so they are very, very peculiar. We have also stones about planet Earth, but planet Earth, not from now, planet Earth from, uh, let's say, millions of years ago, right? Uh, we have also plants and animals extinct. We have mythological creatures also. We have uh, space machines or what uh, Dr. Cabrera believes are space machines and especially medical procedures, which surprisingly, Dr. Cabrera, he's a doctor, as a doctor, he was a very, very fascinated for anything about medical procedures and uh, the stones usually had uh, information about medical procedures, right? Um, so also, uh, for your information, um, I would like to tell you how is the way Dr. Cabrera refer or call uh, the stones. So he called the stones gliptolitos, right? So the stones were the cliptolitos and the creators of the stones were the cliptonianos, right? Um, he also, uh, during his years of investigations he did in his, in his museum, he paid for also lots of investigations privately done to the stones. He met all kinds of specialists, all kinds of, um, let's say, uh, ufologists, uh, and he also created his own theory about the stones. Um, of course, most of the information at the end seems that it was a, a speculation from his side, but he believed that after so many years of being in contact of the stones, observing the stones, uh, he could, um, let's say, have to take the license of uh, speculate on some things. Um, so, uh, first of all, the Kleptonianos were from the Pleiades. Uh, they, uh, these sort of like humanoids, uh, populated planet Earth about 65 to 60 million years ago. And they coexisted with dinosaurs. Um, and that's how also they were able to imprint or design in these stones uh, figures of these um, animals, right? Um, and that the moment when they left planet Earth was also the moment of the big cataclysm that happened that extincted also the uh, dinosaurs uh, of planet Earth, right? Um, so going back to the stones of Dr. Cabrera, uh, here you can even see the hand of Dr. Cabrera in the interview, the only interview you will find in uh, YouTube of him. Um, later I will share with you the link where you can find this interview. Uh, so he explained that um, the stones that are, of course, the, the ones that he um, made put part of his collection um, are fragile 
So they, they are very heavy, but they are very fragile. And when they are softly like hit, they break easily. Uh, here also you can see this element in the, in the core, which is the hard section, it's the pebble section. And this other element superficial here is what he believed was a type of cement that was used to cover the pebbles in purpose, of course, by this uh, Cliptonianos, and that uh, they design softly, easily on this cement-like element. And of course, the passing of millions of years ago, uh, millions of years, sorry, had um, uh, made this, um, uh, this material to be very hard, right? So this is how naturally this, this, um, this material turned into a stone. Now, this was one of the explanations he gave also in this interview. Um, so now we're going to uh, see, first of all, very briefly, very fast, some of these stones. I will also talk about the different types. And I will share with you in a moment a website where we're going to get to see better uh, and also a more wider variety of these uh, pictures, right? So um, first of all, well, uh, remember that in these uh, stones we see, for example, the cosmos. Uh, so we have, for example, a Cliptoniano observing the stars, uh, um, observing uh, the passing of comets. Uh, also, that's one of the reasons why Mr. Cabrera, Dr. Cabrera, says that um, these Cliptonianos populated planet Earth about 65 million years ago because he connected the passing of one uh, comet very close to planet Earth in that time. Uh, also, in some of the stones, you can see um, a, a fauna and a flora that definitely is from another era, extincted flora and fauna. Um, also, in some of these stones, he shows the Kleptonianos, which he refers uh, as, as humanoids, which were not exactly like humans the way how we look. Like, for example, in this section, he's making a comparison between the way how the Kleptonianos look and comparing them to the human bodies, referring that the way how these Kleptonianos look uh, were more like the ones, uh, the, the distribution of, of, of a baby's body. So, uh, he believe also they look different, slightly different to uh, the humans of nowadays. Uh, there are also some stones that refer to planet Earth and also to the way how planet Earth looked uh, 65 million years ago. Um, the emerging of different continents. In a moment, I'm going to talk in detail about this. So continents that are nowadays are under the ocean, uh, um, continents that uh, now are separated, for example, or united. So this is supposed to be two sides of planet Earth. And that's why he believed uh, to make all of these um, designs of planet Earth, uh, you, you needed to, to have uh, the possibility of moving out of the planet Earth. So that's why he believed uh, these uh, Kleptonianos were from outer space originally. Uh, sirens, for example, and mermaids, sorry and a um, uh, carnivore plants and, and a sort of like a mythological fauna and, and creatures that um, only you can see, of course, in these stones or maybe in myths from around the world. This is a um, stone in which you can see a um, Kleptoniano. Uh, looks like riding or basically like a, uh, being taken on the skies, right, by a, a creature or a um, sort of like a, 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 a type of spaceship. Huh? Um, and we have also the section that was the, the one that fascinated the most uh, Dr. Cabrera, which was everything about medicine, right? So we have from C-sections, transplants of organs, uh, and also uh, something that trapped his attention deeply, which was um, what he understood was blood transfusions from pregnant women to people who were receiving organs, like who were receiving transplants of organs. And he said that uh, in the plasma of the blood of pregnant women, there is an enzyme or an element that permits the person who is going to receive a new organ to accept the organ 
in, in a better way, more efficient way. So that for him was a great finding. And even he did his own research about these, um, these enzymes uh, and, and he believed this is the information, this um, uh, humanoids from the past wanted to transmit to the humans of this time, right? Um, also, in some of these series, we can see the um, uh, C-sections of creatures such as, for example, dinosaurs. And here you can clearly see a C-section and a dinosaur coming out from the belly of another dinosaur. Uh, of course, uh, there were many specialists who refused uh, the immediately, of course, these, these uh, stones uh, because we know that, well, or that the idea, the general idea is that dinosaurs are oviparous or were oviparous. So, um, but this is sort of like a, a mammal birth, right? C-section. Um, but um, he said, well, that probably there were species of dinosaurs which were not oviparous. So um, Nazca lines represented uh, uh, in the stones, so the famous lines of the Nazca people and different dinosaurs. So we're going now to give a look to, um, e let, let me just show you something really interesting. We're going to give a look to a website which, by the way, my friends, I highly, highly recommend you if you have some time and you want to see also a wider collection of pictures, this site. I don't know if you can see it here. Yeah, and I'm going to also, at the end of the event, show you more properly the complete link for you to take a picture. So this is a website that is not officially from the museum. Uh, it was made by an investigator who also talks about, uh, well, the critiques to, to the stones and also the, um, the points that Dr. Cabrera uh, defended uh, for their veracity. Their veracity. Um, so this, this is a page that is very, like, in between. It opens, you know, like, all conversations uh, about uh, all the possibilities. So uh, the reason why I wanted to show you these stones is, first of all, look at the classification also this specialist has done on the stones. Of course, they are 15,000. We will not check on 15,000 pieces of stone. But I have taken the license to show you, I have selected some for you. Uh, and then you can come back here and you can see on your own. So we have, for example, um, these stones over here, which are about the different specimens of dinosaurs who were discovered of, who were recognized, sorry, recognized in the stones. So we have, for example, the, all of them are very popular, like very famous um, uh, 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 types of, of dinosaurs. For example, the Megalosaurus, Stegosaurus, right? Uh, we have the Archaeopteryx, oh, so the ones that fly, right? Uh, Diplodocus, right? So we have different, um, quite, quite uh, popular <laughs> uh, dinosaurs, right? The Triceratops, for example, there are many uh, with the shape of the tri Triceratops um, and, and several other, right? So in this section, you can see the dinosaurs, right? And uh, for example, some of them like this one in the position of, um, let's say, a man uh, or a Kryptoniano dominating the dinosaur. We have also other series. Uh, we have like uh, nowadays animals, you know, animals like, for example, monkeys and snakes. We have humanoids, right? Um, in the case of the humanoids, there are some that are sexual uh, representations. Uh, we have also, for example, this one here is the uh, maternidad, maternity, no? Uh, Kleptonianas that are pregnant or given birth or with babies. Uh, we have also uh, other that are very interesting. This one here, for example, this is C-section on a dinosaur, right? This is a C-section. Mm -hmm. um, remember that the ones that are medical are usually the, the ones that Dr. Cabrera put more attention uh, to. So C-section, for example, cesarea, C-section of twins, of mellizos, heart over here, kidneys over here. So a, a quite large understanding of 
uh, the, the human body and different organs in the body. Uh, and we have also chirurgic materials or tools, right? So this is um, transfusions, for example, um, uh, sort of like in the, in a, uh, uh, let's say, in, in a medical uh, uh, environment, right? Um, we have also other that I want to share to finish this because you can also come back and see all of this collection. It's really big. But I want to share with you the ones that are considered also very, very interesting here. Aha. Uh -huh. So this one here uh, is um, the stone, which is one of the most beloved of the collection of Dr. Cabrera. Uh, this is the one of planet Earth. Well, maybe you remember I mentioned uh, about the planet Earth. And you can see here uh, uh, two sides of planet Earth, like seen from two positions, right? So we have here this first section that has four continents, right? Uh, which you can see also here. So this one here is North America. This is by his investigations. He referred to this one as North America, South America. Uh, this one here is Mu continent, which part of it is below the Pacific. And this is the Atlantida, right? Uh, in the other section of the sphere, uh, we have also part of the Atlantida, part of what is nowadays Africa. We have also um, the Arabic uh, Peninsula, right? We have uh, Australia, right? And we have also part of the Mu continent uh, that is uh, now below the, the waters of the Pacific. So uh, he also, as you know already, he took lots of licenses to explain most of these stones. Um, for example, well, he says that these stones refer to planet Earth like 65 million years ago. There was less amount of water in planet Earth. And also, from a closer perspective, what we can see here is like a halo of sort of like undulating shapes like this uh, that are all around the circle of planet Earth. And he says that this represent that there used to be lots of vapors in, in the atmosphere back then. So uh, the uh, they say the oxygen, you know, was loaded with more water and there was more water in the atmosphere. And, and later, of course, this water uh, precipitated down. So that's why we have more uh, water in the ocean. So this was the explanation he gave. And, and many other of these stones were explained by him uh, in detail after years of, uh, well, this observation of these stones. So, well, this is just to give you an idea of the... Um, now, how fascinating also how big the collection is. So let's go now to our uh, ex uh, exposition, right? So um, also to mention, to refer a little bit about the uh, composition of the stones. So the stones are um, andesita uh, or andesite stones. Uh, so at, at some point they can be you know, more soft than other stones, of course. So it's easy to carve uh, on them. Right. But um, part of the um, the theory that uh, Mr. or Dr. Cabrera uh, embraced uh, to to say or uh, these these stones are for real. They were not rep uh, copies or creation or or a fictional story is that um, the stones who he had in his power, some of them were sent to uh, do some um, investigations, some uh, studies, uh, and they were discovered to have a patina, which is, uh, you can see also over here, patina, which is sort of like pellicular, sort of like a, a, a coverage, a natural protection that um, happens when a long period of time passes. So, for example, if you take a stone, like a regular stone, let's say, and I cut the stone, right? The stone can be very old, but if I cut it in this moment, that cut will not have a patina, right? Because it's a new cut, right? It's exposed uh, material from inside the stone, so it don't have this pellicula. So uh, these stones, the ones he uh, chosen, he selected some and also paid 
for, invest, uh, for private investigations to be done on them, he discovered patina in those. So meaning that these stones were millions of years old. Um, so these were, these, this is, this, um, let's say, um, uh, uh, reason and the other ones I mentioned before were the ones uh, that uh, Dr. Cabrera used and hold on very tight to defend uh, the stones he uh, collected. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Cabrera unfortunately passed away in the year 2001. I never met Dr. Cabrera but since I hear about his story I was really fascinated about it uh, and that's why also today I am sharing this with you all. I was able also to read the message of the Piedras Gravadas de Ica, the message of the engraved stones of Ica which is his only book dedicated to the stones. So it is a available in internet by the way and he made this book in the year 1976 so uh, it is a really fascinating way to understand his uh, point of view about the stones and and what he has to say about the this the message in them right um but he was not the only person who dedicated a book to the stones. Uh, also, a famous bestseller, J.J. Benitez, an Spanish writer who uh, has uh, created lots of amazing books which are still bestsellers. I think the most famous of his books is uh, The Troy Horse, Caballo de Troya, um, that also he's very into uh, the UFO themes and also time travels and, and all of that. Uh, he dedicated one book to the stones of Ica and uh, is this one here, Existió Otra Humanidad. Another uh, humanity existed, right? And here you can see the book uh, cover from a little closer perspective. And you can see, of course, that there is one of these stones of Ica in the cover. So uh, J.J. Benitez also came to Peru uh, and he was able to get in touch uh, with the stones, with Mr. Basilio Uchuya, and well, uh, that's the reason well, how finally he was inspired about this theme and he created the book. But now, my friends, we have to go to the other side of the story because we have to talk about the detractors and the, the critics uh, uh, who consider these stones a fraud. So I always like in this mystery series to uh, give you both points of views. In that way, at the end of this story, you will take your own, uh, make your own, uh, let's say, decisions about, you know, which one you think is, is the, the one that is real, no? So, um, well, uh, here, of course, you can see a very long, long list of, um, let's say, uh, reasons uh, that the detractors, uh, let's say, use to say that these stones are not real. Let me just hit the highlights with you. You can take also a picture and later you can give it a read if you wish. Um, but based, first of all, um, some of the investigators who were able to get in contact with the stones, which were not so many, and also after a certain amount of time, Dr. Cabrera decided not to give his stones anymore to anyone because uh, he realized everybody was sort of like believing uh, this was a fraud and, and he is, it's just was tired of of defending the stones. So he decided just to stop any type of speculations and he decided not to give any more interviews. And that's how, well, at the end, um, we, don't, we don't really have any more information directly from Dr. Cabrera. So first of all, uh, an investigator called Vicente Paris, uh, he was able to see and to have in his power some stones from the collection of Dr. Cabrera. And he found that in some of these stones, which were the majority, there was no patina. Uh, so meaning that probably there were some stones who were really old, but some other were not that old, right? So, uh, so partially this could be a fraud indeed in the, in the position of Mr. Vicente Paris. Also, another interesting element is that the stones uh, depict 
dinosaurs, but always dinosaurs that are the most popular, like the ones that you can see a, like um, in any history book, like uh, a, even a school book, right? So always the most popular dinosaurs. Never, you know, the, the dinosaurs more like a complicated or new species of them, for example. And also from different times, from different eras. So that's very strange too. Um, because the stones are not made of organic material, it was impossible to date them in carbon-14. Um, so that is also something that makes it very, very complicated uh, to know exactly when they were made. But the problem is also that we don't know where the stones were obtained because another way to analyze the stones is um, going to the place where the stones were discovered and see like the stratification of the soil. So the deeper uh, the soil where, where these, these stones were founded, you know, we can analyze also the era in which they existed. But unfortunately, uh, none of the uh, people who supply of stones to Dr. Cabrera or any other collectors of, of those stones wanted to say where the stones came from, right? So these are some of the reasons why it's believed that um, this was a fraud. Um, one of the archaeologists who stand against uh, these, um, these stones, uh, that, that say them to be uh, like real uh, archaeological evidence, uh, was Neil Steady. And he also did an investigation in which he found no patina in the stone again in the stones. Um, and this man is not just a archaeologist, he's a very important archaeologist who has worked in different parts of uh, the Americas, uh, in Mexico, Central America, and in Peru, as well in other parts of the world. So he has a, a let's say, a, a renowned, he's a renowned archaeologist. Mm -hmm. uh, also, another thing interesting, uh, they were discovered in some of the stones traces of modern painting, modern painting, right? So as if the uh, stone was marked first and then polished, or maybe even with uh, like a modern uh, sandpaper, for example, to make them look more shiny, right? So this is what the detractors say that they found in some of the stones. Surprisingly, my friends, for, for, for you that possibly know about Eric von Daniken, a famous ufologist, also writer, um, he believed that the stones were a fraud. Why? Well, very curious, because he was able to meet Basilio Chuya, because he was also looking for the stones, the origin of the stones, right? He met Basilio Chuya, and Mr. Basilio Chuya confessed to him that they were a fraud because they were made by him. So how come from one day to another, Mr. Basilio Chuya, who sold 15,000 stones uh, to um, Dr. Cabrera, like he made a name, a sort of like reputation um, uh, as, as a person who facilitated the stones, or like real stones, said, I made the stones. So here you can see some pictures from Basilio Chuya, um, uh, like a, made by a, um, a, let's say, a, a, a magazine, a magazine, a Peruvian magazine, um, in which he shows, it, it poses with these, what we call laminas, these images of dinosaurs, and in which he says he use these dinosaurs, these images, to replicate them in the stones and to, you know, make the stones that he later sold to Dr. Cabrera. And he even show right, to this magazine uh, in this picture how he made the, uh, the drawings. Uh, so how this happened, almost from one day to another, uh, he retracted from his word. Well, there is a possible explanation for this, not necessarily saying like, well, of course, uh, this was a fraud and that's why he said it. No, no. If we even, you know, try to still believe that these stones were real, the, probably the reason of someone like him to say, to deny completely that he found these stones in archaeological side is that 
he was afraid to go in to jail, right? Why? Um, also, in the same time when uh, Eric Von Daniken um, went to, to him and tried to reach out to him, you know, to, to, to learn about the origin of the stones, um, something very, very curious happened also in the life of Mr. Uh, Basilio. Uh, the government of Peru already realized, you know, always late because in Latin America is like that. <laughs> it takes it takes decades sometimes for us to do something. So the government of Peru, the Ministry of Culture of Peru realized about what well, these um th these these stones uh, also they realized in the government that the stones were becoming famous worldwide that uh, television from from Russia was coming, television from North America was coming, from Europe was coming in general to meet Dr. Cabrera and to learn about this mystery. So in that moment, the Ministry of Culture said, oh, we have to do something, right? Because we are, you know, looking really bad, like uh, is we, as we are not uh, taking care of our uh, patrimony. So uh, what happened is that they went to Basilio, to Mr. Basilio, and they took them uh, in prison uh, for, for a short period of time, asking him, if he was a looter, right? Uh, and Mr. Basilio knew he had a lot to lose because look at this law. The law 28.29.6 of Peru, uh, which is the general law of protection for the patrimony of Peru, says that in part of the uh, article says that uh, if you are being collated, you are connected with the looting, not that you are selling the products, but if you know about looting and you're not denouncing the looting, you can be fined with a lot of money, over 4,000 soles, uh, a lot of money. Uh, it's, it's over 1,000 US dollars, right? Of that time, well, it was a lot of money. Uh, but also, if you are syndicated as looter and you accept you are a looter, you can go to jail not less than three years and no more than eight years according to, well, the, uh, the situation in, in which you are. Remember, uh, Mr. Basilio sold over 15,000 stones, so he at least deserved the eight years of prison. So if I was him, uh, I would always say that they were made by me. It, it doesn't matter if it was true or not. So that's probably what happened in that moment and and well he wanted to preserve of course his uh, his freedom so that's why he started to say to all the medias that uh, of course he made the stones so um he died some years ago and um, later also in another interview one of the last interviews he gave he said once again that they were not made by him that he, they were real uh, so uh, it is going to be always like a big mystery in that sense um, this is also the, the sign of the museum uh, that exists nowadays in Ica, the Museo de Piedras Gravadas, the Museum of the Engraved Stones of Ica, which is located right next to the main square of Ica. Uh, nowadays, the son of Dr. Cabrera is the one who takes care of the museum, uh, well, in behalf of his father oh, that passed away in 2001, and it is also one of the most interesting museums you can see in Peru. We have all kinds of museums in Peru. We have archaeological museums, we have uh, museums about music, we have museums about food, and well, we have museums about engraved stones made by a, 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 a ancient uh, humanity <laughs> that, well, by the story, you know, uh, it was extincted or disappeared from planet Earth about, well, millions of years ago. So here you can see the website of the museum, Museo Científico Javier Cabrera. Uh, you can find them even on TripAdvisor, just to give you an idea of uh, how famous they are. Uh, remember that they have more than 15,000 stones in the collection uh, and well my friends we're coming to the end of this event here also some extra information such as for example external sources I've used to create this event this YouTube event uh, we have also here this is the, the link to the interview of Dr. Cabrera if you want to give a look to this interview hear his voice 
get to see him also, him and his stones. Nowadays, to see the stones and to be in that place, you need to pay an admission fee of more or less $10, right? And you have to do it with previous coordination with the museum and also pay in advance. <laughs> and finally, well, the, the pictures that I share at the during the event, maybe you remember, are in this website. So thank you so much, my friends, for coming to this night of mystery. Here you have all my in information, my Facebook group, my Facebook, my Instagram, my YouTube channel. If you want to see videos about uh, history of Peru, you have also my website and well, my other contacts also there. Thank you for your participation. Amigos, amigas, eh, muchas gracias. It is always a pleasure to have you here at home. Eh, tomorrow, I'm going to eh, I'm, I'm going to Barranco. We're going to have a street tour if you wish uh, to join me. And if you have some free time, I would love to have you also. Eh, we're going to talk about the architectures of Lima, the architectural styles of the 20th century. We are going in the search of different architectural styles of Lima. Uh, so, well, I hope you can come. It would be lovely to have you. Barranco is always beautiful. It's going to be during the morning time. So I hope you have some time. Uh, it's going to be so far. Remember, Lou, at 11, 11.30 a.m. so far, I remember my time, Lima time. So um, also, please follow my channel. Uh, give me a follow in the upper part. When you click there, you will see my tour tomorrow with your time. See? So... Uh, I'm sure you might be uh, like uh, Ottawa might be close to my time, right, Lou? Uh, in this moment, by the way, it is 7.35 p.m. <laughs> so just to give you an idea, the time difference. Oh, muchas gracias, amigos. Thank you so much. Remember, next week, we're going to talk about uh, the uh, written system of the Incas. Uh, so was there any any you know, reading system in Peru. We're going to talk about that. Uh, and well, we're going to be also soon talking about more mysteries, more controversials, more untold stories. All of my series are going to be here. Uh, so Bernard, what do you think about the stones? Real or not? Well, Bernard, and to be very honest, as a tour guide married to an archaeologist, my husband is an archaeologist, it is still very hard to me to believe that um, the, the stones were real because I always hear about his uh, more scientific, more, in a way, close-minded uh, opinion. So sometimes I am, you know, taken more in direction to the, to the more formal um, uh, explanations. But uh, also, uh, I still believe no, that some of these mysteries cannot be only solved uh, with the scientific uh, explanations that nowadays we have because there is way more that escapes from the hands of the archaeologist. So that's why I, I consider we should never close our minds to just one answer. I love to have multiple answers and always keep open to the many possibilities. Uh, that's why also I like this series. <laughs> So, gracias amigos, gracias Lou, thank you, thank you, thank you, gracias Pamela, oh, it's always a pleasure to have you, I hope you enjoy, sorry for the little interruptions that we had uh, during during the, the event, oh, my girls are always around, <laughs> and please don't forget to give me your um, uh, sort of like a, your, your requests for upcoming events because I'm, I sometimes I, I don't have like idea what could be good so at the end you're going to be given a, 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 a section for uh, send it to your emails for uh, commenting about the tour and if you want I read always the comments thank you always by the way for your comments um, you can also tell me there um, like, don't be shy. Like, Vanessa, would you like maybe to talk about this next time? So I'm going to be doing a, a list of your requests for the upcoming events. So no, thank you so much for coming. Gracias, Bernhard. Mwah, thank you so much for your support. Amigos, your support helps me also to, to continue doing these events, to, to take, you know, like a, 
the time also invest this time in creating this content it helps me a lot helps my family a lot and also helps the website a lot because as you know this is a, a just tip supported um, a website so if you if you uh, have the possibility of course uh, not everybody has the chance every day to support but if you have the possibility to support uh, also hey go with a tip uh, and me well is highly highly appreciated um, muchas gracias god bless you all Mwah. have a lovely rest of the day the evening and hope to see you tomorrow see you tomorrow uh best to you all gracias gracias uh and let's keep always be like open-minded right because you know every year there are new things uh like investigated there are new uh, let's say theories coming uh so we are always learning something new so well ha gracias gracias have a lovely rest of the day Bye-bye. See you. Ciao.